You can begin, Lisa. Good evening. My name is Lisa Austin, and I'll be your moderator for this class. Welcome to another lecture given by the members of the Southfield Michigan Bible class. This is a school and not a church, and neither are we affiliated with any religious organization. This school is a nonprofit, non-denominational, religious and scientific research organization dedicated to showing proof of the existence of Yahweh our Elohim and the operation of his eternal purpose, pattern and plan, operating throughout eternity to this present day. This school was established as a result of a divine vision and revelation given to our founder, Dr. Henry Clifford Kinley in the state of Ohio in the year 1931. We hold classes in the United States, Canada, and certain other foreign countries. The Southfield Michigan Bible class was established in 1997. The Dean of the Southfield Michigan class is Dr. Marvin Lewis, and the president is Dr. Edward Yule. In this school, we use the true, correct, and original name and title of the Father, the Word or Son, and the Holy Spirit, which are contained in the original Hebrew text. The true name of the Heavenly Father is Yahweh. It has been improperly substituted by Lord. The true title of the word or son is Elohim. It has been improperly substituted by God. The name of the Holy Spirit manifested in or out of a physical body is Yahshua. It has been erroneously substituted by Jesus Christ. Lord and God are titles and not names. The Apostle Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, tells us in 1 Corinthians 8 and 5 that there are Lord's many and God's many. But we now know that each Lord must have a name and each God must have a name also. Elohim is a title, but unlike Lord and God, Elohim is a divine title. That means Elohim is the title that our creator chose for himself. Jesus is a name, but it is an erroneous name. A minor investigation on your part in a good dictionary or encyclopedia would prove that neither the Hebrew language, the Greek language, nor the Latin language have any characters or letters in their alphabet that would produce the sound that is made by this letter J. Neither was there a letter J in the English language until some 1400 years after the Messiah's death. Therefore, such names as Jesus and Jehovah are impossible renderings of the true and original name of our Father and his Son. Christ is a title just like Lord and God. Yahweh is pure spirit, and in this state he is incomprehensible and inscrutable. He is the ultimate source, substance, limits and bounds of everything. We have Yahweh in his pure spirit state, symbolized on this chart as a cloud. Yahweh is not a cloud. He merely chose the cloud to symbolize himself because a cloud has no particular or descriptive shape and form. We have drawn this cloud all around the edges of this chart to show you that everything on this chart is within the cloud. In like manner, Everything in the universe abides within the pure spirit state of Yahweh. Yahweh, knowing that man could not perceive of him in this pure spirit state, took on shape and took on form right within himself as Elohim. This is the word or son, a super incorporeal being that is having the shape and form of a man, but without flesh and blood. This form can only be seen in divine vision and understood in divine revelations. Later on, this self-same spirit manifested himself in a physical body and walked the earth plane as Yahshua the Messiah, whom the world calls Jesus Christ. Now, there is only one name given unto salvation, and we must know that name 
So the simple yet intelligent question that we should ask ourselves is, what was the name of the Savior during the time he walked the earth plane? A further understanding of this name and title may be had by reading the preface of the Holy Name Bible. Also at this school, we teach by the divine pattern of the universe. It is called the divine pattern because it is Yahweh's pattern. After Yahweh led the children of Israel out of Egypt, he called Moses atop Mount Sinai and showed him the tabernacle pattern in a vision. Yahweh instructed Moses to build one exactly like it in the wilderness of Sinai. The pattern consists of a most holy place, holy place, and a court roundabout. These three compartments make up the one tabernacle pattern. In this school, we show proof that everything in the universe is made and operates according to the structure and function of this threefold tabernacle pattern and that absolutely nothing escapes the pattern. The primary constitutional objective and aims are as follows. First, to help you find and know Yahweh, our Elohim, as he really is and actually exists. Second, to form a nucleus of universal brotherhood of humanity in Yahshua the Messiah without distinction of race or nationality, creed, sex, caste, or color. Third, to investigate the unexplained spirit law or so-called law of nature and the powers latent in man. Fourth, to encourage and promote the study of the scriptures, comparative religions, psychology, philosophy, and modern practical and occult science. Fifth, to extirpate current superstition, skepticism, and ignorance. Sixth, to learn, know, and understand the operation of Yahweh's eternal purpose through the dispensations and ages. Seventh, to discern and avoid being deceived by Lucifer, the serpent, the devil, the dragon, or Satan and his demons operating the mystery of iniquity on earth through the dispensations of time. Eighth, to earnestly contend for the common salvation and faith which was once delivered unto the sons or children of Yahweh. Ninth, to make known that Yahweh from the beginning ordained, there is no other name given among men whereby man can be saved, saving the name of Yahshua the Messiah and tenth to inherit eternal life now in the kingdom of Yahshua the Messiah with the hope of immortal glorification in the new earth state. Our watchword is peace and our slogan is speak the truth. I'd like to welcome everyone out. Thank you for joining us to study again to learn more about Yahweh Elohim and his purpose and pattern and plan. I'd like to have the class dedicated in prayer by Dr. Lauren Lewis. Our scripture lesson will be 2 Corinthians, the fourth chapter. That will be read by Dr. April Lewis. And again, welcome. Dr. Lewis. I'd like to say good evening to the class. Can we bow our hearts and minds in the moment of prayer? Thanking Yahshua for giving us another opportunity and moment to learn more perfectly of his purpose, pattern, and plan. We ask that the speakers that come onto the floor tonight uh, deliver your gospel in righteousness <clears throat> and that you speak through every vessel that is called on the floor. All these things that we ask in our brother and Savior's name, Yahshua the Messiah, let us all say hallelujah. 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 Good evening, class. This evening scripture lesson will be 2 Corinthians, the fourth chapter. And I'll be reading out of the King James Bible using the true and correct name and title where appropriate. 2 Corinthians 4. Therefore, seeing we have this ministry, 
As we have received mercy, we faint not, but have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness nor handling the word of Yahweh deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of Yahweh. But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of the Messiah, who is the image of Yahweh, should shine unto them. For we preach not ourselves, but the Messiah Yahshua, the Savior, and ourselves, your servants, for Yahshua's sake. For Yahweh, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, hath shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of Yahweh in the face of Yahshua the Messiah. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels, that the excellency of the power may be of Yahweh and not of us. We are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Cast down, but not destroyed. Always bearing about in the body, the dying of the Savior, Yahshua, that the life also of Yahshua might be made manifest in our body. For we which live are always delivered unto death for Yahshua's sake, that the life also of Yahshua might be made manifest in our mortal flesh. So then death worketh in us, but life in you. We having the same spirit of faith, according as it is written, I believed and therefore have I spoken. We also believe and therefore speak, knowing that he which raised up the Savior, Yahshua, shall raise up us also by Yahshua and shall present us with you. For all things are for your sakes, that the abundant grace might, through the thanksgiving of many, redound the glory of Yahweh, for which cause we faint not. But though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are temporal but the things which are not seen are eternal. Hallelujah. That was 2 Corinthians, the fourth chapter. Hallelujah. Thank you, Dr. Lewis and Dr. Lewis for the beautiful prayer and for the scripture. Again, I'd like to welcome our brethren, visiting brethren and members. Um, tonight is Science Thursday. And so I am going to turn it over to our host, Dr. Felicia Hamilton. Good evening, and thank you, Dr. Austin. Thank you for the scripture and the prayer. I am very, very excited um, about what Yahweh has given me to show to the brethren today about today's topic. Um, but before we begin with that, um, I was talking to Dr. Uh, Dorian Lewis before class, and I told him that um, as we were doing textbook on Tuesday, Yahweh transported me back all the way to my 12th grade chemistry class and reminded me of a few things that are pertinent to not only this gospel, but um, the way that we go about teaching in this school. So I would like to um, present that to you as Joshua is telling me to do, because that is my duty as a son. And um, to show you just the awesomeness of this gospel and, and why we do what we do. And I think for me, that's the biggest thing. And I, I appreciate Dr. Lewis um, going through that 
on Tuesday because um, it admonished me, well, Yahweh through him saying it admonished me to do the same uh, for Science Thursday because oftentimes we may get, um, it can be so routine that we forget, first of all, how we obtain the knowledge that we have about Yahweh and then the responsibilities that we have to make sure what we are saying is true and scientifically proven. So Science Thursdays, as most of you know, um, are based on the um, are based on all things science in uh, the gospel, which is pretty much everything. But its uh, its basis is this chart and the booklet that was authored by the late Dr. Lejeune Gill, who was the wife of Dr. Um, Dr. Gill, the dean of the Springfield, Ohio class. And Dr. Lejeune Gill was a lover of science, like so many of us. I mean, she just she loved science, and she loved that Yahweh was showing her um, the things about science and how to uh, transport or relate that to the things that are physical to the spiritual. So um, I love the textbooks that Yahweh gave her or the pamphlets that Yahweh gave her to author because um, it does open up your understanding to a whole new um, field of, of things to show you the power of Yahweh and that he is definitely the author and finisher of our faith and that there is definitely a creator. So uh, the way these classes work, we are um, going to read from this um, pamphlet, but we will also be reading a couple of excerpts from the textbook, which is Yahweh, uh, Elohim, the archetype original pattern of the universe. The first edition of that book was published in 1961. The second edition was published in 1969. And that textbook, when it was sent out in 1961, revolutionized the world and it drove the Catholic Church to put out a Bible that contained the true names. And that was um, copyrighted in 1963. So I was just listening to, I think it was SoundCloud number two with Dr. Kenley said, see, we drove them to it because they tried to say that they knew the name and they were the first, but their book wasn't copyrighted until some two years after the original Elohim book was copyrighted. So for us, it is um, imperative that we take a step back, think about what captivated you about this gospel and ask Yahweh to bring that back into your heart. It's like your first love. Think about, you know, if you're married or you're with a significant other, what was it about that person that captivated you, that attracted you to them? Flip that to the spirit. What was it or what is it about this gospel that you just can't let go? You can't see yourself anywhere else, just like you wouldn't see yourself with anybody else. So think about that, meditate on that, and then ask Yahweh to show you um, how to express that through the gospel and through these lectures. So here again, we are going to um, go to one section of this booklet called Science and Image of the Creator, The Rising Sun. But before we do, we're going to speak to the scientific method. If you listen to the moderator, she said this is a uh, religious and scientific research organization. Now, a lot of times when we hear that, we say, oh, when they say scientific, that means we go into science as well. Yes and no. And that's where I was telling Dr. Uh, Lewis that that's when Yahweh transported me back to my 12th grade um, chemistry class. And I had this one, this chemistry teacher is a black man. He was very intimidating, but one of the main things he kept telling us, he said, as a student of science, you have to always remember that your scientific research involves steps. You have to follow those steps every single time you have a theory and you're trying to prove that theory. So I, you know, and I was like, oh, you know, Yahweh, I forgot. So the scientific research doesn't necessarily talk mean that we're talking about science. Scientific research means there is a method and an order and a pattern to doing research. 
We talked about that a little bit on Tuesday where you can't just go to any rep, any site that you see. It has to be a reputable site. Before the internet was prevalent, when I was coming up in school, you had to go to the library. And I remember, you know, looking through the card catalog and going by the Dewey Decimal System and taking that number and going to the rolls of books and looking for the numbers and then going to find your book. And then when you had to do a um, any kind of paper, any kind of research paper, you had to do what was called, you have to have a bibliography. And that bibliography, you had to cite every single source that you use to write that paper. I don't care what how small the sentence was, because if you didn't, it would be considered plagiarism. So you had to go through a method. You had to have that bibliography and you had to cite those sources. That way, when someone reads your paper and they do this now, I had to do this for my master's thesis, and I know they have to do it for your uh, doctorate thesis, that person that is reading it and is gonna approve it and say, okay, you're good, they need to be able to go and research those sites and those booklets and those articles that you said you used to come up with this conclusion. So that is what scientific research is. It's a pet, it's a pattern and it's a method to do research. So uh, Dr. Dorian Lewis will be reading um, this information for me and then I'll interject um, as I need to. I think it's either him or Dr. Sonia Roberts, whichever one, that's fine. So if you can go ahead and, and read what you see on the screen. Sorry. Scientific okay. research or preparation. Encyclopedia Britannica. Scientific method, mathematical and experimental technique employed in the sciences. More specifically, it is the technique used in the construction and testing of a scientific hypothesis. Okay, pause right there. So a lot of times, and I know everyone knows this, the theory of rel relativity, right? So I remember in one class we were talking and someone said, see, that's why it's a theory. But the theory has been proven. The theory of relativity is E equals MC squared. And we're going to go through that. That's been proven. It's just that the world has hung on to the name of theory of relativity, but it is a proven fact. And the way he proved it is by what Dr. Lewis is gonna read in this next paragraph. Go ahead. The scientific method is critical to the development of scientific theories, which explain empirical, experiential laws in a scientifically rational manner. It is a typical application of the scientific method, excuse me, in a typical application of the scientific method, a researcher develops a hypothesis, tests it through various means, and then modifies the hypothesis on the basis of the outcome of the tests and experiments. Pause right there. So once again, if you have, let's, let's take it to class. If you ask a question in class and someone gives you an answer, or like we always say, um, our first aim is to help you find and know Yahweh or Elohim as he really is and actually exists. Now, we know that that started off as to find Yahweh or Elohim. Well, why did it change? It changed because the scientific method was followed. The scientific method is, who is Yahweh? What is he about? The who, what, when, where, and why? And then Dr. Kinley, through the process of those steps was able to verify and prove his quote unquote theory. So now uh, first aim changes from to find and know Yahweh to help you find, because for me, Felicia Hamilton, it's proven to me the theory is no longer a theory. So I don't question that he saw something. I know for myself, but see, this is an individual thing. Everyone has to go through that process on their own. So continue to read, Dr. Lewis. The modified hypothesis is then retested, further modified, and tested again. Pause. The now, uh, Dr. Uh, Rhonda Brazil has been uh, very instrumental in saying this lately, I think in the last few months. And then um, I think uh, one of our visitors, Dr. Carla Carter, said it as well. This is a research. So you search and you research. So that hypothesis says, you test the hypothesis, hypothesis, but guess what? You got to turn around and retest it. 
So now where Yahweh has us, and I'm noticing that he's having us go back to the things that we heard, that we ingested, that we took for truth and having us look at those again for ourselves to make sure that we know that this is true. So for me, it's not a matter anymore of listening to someone's explanation and just accepting that. Now it's a matter of, okay, that makes sense. Let me take my notes. Let me go back in the law and the prophets. Let me go back in the fulfillment and see if there's evidence to that. That's your testing of the hypothesis. Okay, go ahead and continue, Dr. Lewis. The modified hypothesis is then retested, further modified, and tested again until it becomes consistent with observed phenomena and testing outcomes. Mm -hmm. In this way, hypotheses serve as tools by which scientists gather data. From that data and the many different scientific investigations undertaken to explore hypotheses, scientists are able to develop broad, general explana explanations or scientific theories. Okay, so after you do your test, and that's what I remember from that chemistry class, he would give us an assignment and we would have to do these tests. And then we would write out, well, first he would give us um, a scenario. We would hypothesize on what we thought the outcome would be. We would get our beakers and all our chemicals and all that stuff. And we would, we would perform the experiment. Then when we would see the outcome, we would have to write down what the outcome was. And we would have to look at, okay, this is what I thought would happen, but A, I thought A would happen, but B happened. Why? Then we'd have to turn around and do it all over again and say, oh, I missed a step in there. That's why I thought it would be A versus B. And that's what we're trying to say with these classes. You keep researching, you keep looking, you keep doing, okay, until it's solid in your mind. So like for me, it's solid in my mind that Yahweh is a universal pattern. That's solid for me because I've done my research. I had my little hypothesis that I thought were right. And Yahweh says, no, here, this is how you look at this. So that's what we want to get you in the mindset of is to look at this as just as Dr. Kenley said it in the textbook. And we're going to have Dr. Lewis read that a little bit is that it's a scientific preparation to get you to be able to know how to go about reading these textbooks and being in these classes so that you yourself can start to find the evidence that you need to back up a statement that either you thought or someone else made. So let's move on to our uh, next one. And so that's where we're going to come to here. So in science, and this is the other thing I tell you, I, I was literally sitting there having a um, a vision while Dr. Uh, Lewis was doing this on Tuesday because I, he transported me back to my chemistry class. And then here were the steps that the chemistry teacher told us. So we'll start to read these steps. So go ahead for me, Dr. Lewis. Seven steps to scientific research or preparation. And this is universally known. This is nothing that, you know, my chemistry teacher came up with. This, if you're in a scientific community, you may have one or two extra, or they may be in a different order, but this is the same throughout the scientific community. So here, and I know um, I probably shouldn't call her out, but I will. My cousin is on and she has her master's in biology. And I know she had to go through these steps. So let's start with, uh, let's go ahead and read Dr. Lewis. Number one, question, who, what, when, where, why, how? So that's that hypothesis. If you have a question, write your question down. What is it? And as we are always taught, okay, who is speaking? Why are they speaking? Who are they speaking to? Where is this happening? How is this happening? Continue. Two, research. Reputable sources with documentation. So again, as Dr. Lewis stated on Tuesday, you have to know how to do your research. So when you go out on the internet, and I... I really advise, and I go probably about twice a month now, I go to the library. I still have a library card. I go to the library. Go to the library. Go and, and pick up an encyclopedia. I have a set of encyclopedias I inherited from my grandmother, but go to the library. Pull a book out just to see, because a lot of times when you're on the internet, that is not teaching you how to do research. But if you go into a library, you ask a librarian, you know, and they are very helpful. Hey, how do I research this? They will show you these steps. 
So go to your reputable documents. For us, it's always the law and the profits and the fulfillment. Continue. Number three, hypothesis. After research, what is your opinion about the matter? So you would think the hypothesis would be second, but no. When you have a question, you do research first, then you say, okay, the research I got, here's what I think. That's the way it works. And then what is number four? Four, experiment. Do more research by putting your theory to the test. So that's what Dr. Kenley told us. And I was listening, I think it's the last SoundCloud, which is 49. Dr. Kenley said, I would, and I know I'm not saying it right, but he said, I will count you as a fool if you believe anything I said without making me prove it. So that's what this class is about. This is not a cult, you know, like the other camp is. We say, hey, go out our fourth aim to encourage and promote the study of the scriptures compared to religions. Cults don't do that. They want you to stay within their own boundaries. Listen to what they say. We say, no, put us to the test. Go out there. Do your research, ask questions, go to every church, synagogue, everything you can go to so that you can make sure that what we're telling you is correct. So that's the difference. Okay, continue. Five, data analysis. Anal okay, so now that you've, okay, sorry, go ahead, Dr. Lewis, hmm. repeat. Please. Analyze the results, should that be? Yes, yes, it should be. And I, and I have analysis because that's what I do all day long is analyze hmm. stuff for work. Um, okay, so you have your information, you've done your research, now you have to analyze the results that you have. Look at those compared to your hypothesis and the experiment, the outcome of the experiment. Okay, continue. Six, conclusion. Theory pro proven correct or incorrect? Okay, so depending on what your outcome is, do you need to, to go back and do more research or was that theory proven? Just like that theory of relativity I was talking about, that was proven a long time ago. It's just that people still hang on to the word theory, but it's proven. That's that M equals MC squared. Okay, continue. Seven, communication. Communicate the results. So now that you know and you have that firm footing in that question that Yahweh gave you the answer to and you're sure of it, like I'm sure, like, I know for certainty that Dr. Kenley had a divine vision and revelation. I should be able to communicate that because I went through these steps. So now, and then the bottom, just we already talked about that. So now what I'm going to have um, Dr. Lewis do is, and I think I have it up. Do I have it up? I may not have it up, Dr. Lewis. So you may um, have to go ahead and read it. Um, yeah, let me bring it up. But now we're going to look at the um, textbook. We're going to look at uh, step, sorry, page five, volume one. And this was spoken about in Tuesday's class. And this is where Yahweh had me um, just go back, like I said, to my um, to my uh, 12th grade chemistry class ago. Oh, my goodness. I forgot about those steps of research. And they line up. And oh, let me go back because I did forget to mention something. You notice the seven steps. There are seven steps in scientific research. How many steps are there in the tabernacle pattern? Seven. There are seven. So once again, Yahweh is definitely a pattern. We know that because everything goes by that pattern. Even the way you do research in the scientific community goes by the pattern. It's just, it's amazing when you sit and you really think about it and Yahweh shows you just it blows your mind over and over again. And for me, it's just like, okay, Yahweh, sometimes I had to just stop and go, okay, I, I can't. Okay, can you give me two seconds? I need to, you know, I need to catch my breath here. So I do have the textbook up. So I'm gonna bring it up, Dr. Lewis, before you begin to read it. Oh, I did have it here. Okay, so let me um, share the screen, share a new share. And let me know if you can see it. Mm -hmm. Dr. Roberts. Okay. Awesome. Okay, so here, again, this is what was read on Tuesday, a little bit of it. And we have gone through this over and over again. We would talk about the 12 steps, the 12 steps, completely not really paying attention to the title here. So Dr. Roberts, I'll have you start reading, starting at this title. Basic scriptural and scientific preparation. This divine revelation and vision pictorially illustrated and explained herein 
was shown to the writer by a great panoramic vision which embraces the existence of the eternal Yahweh Elohim, his universal spirit law and purpose through the dispensations and ages. Comparatively speaking, this is a new and revolutionary scriptural teaching which embraces the fields of cosmogony, anatomy, physiology, psychology, philosophy, general science, and eschatology, to mention only a few. This teaching is spiritually transforming the carnal mind and illuminating the understanding of mankind in regards to his theological and religious concepts of Yahweh Elohim and his purpose. It teaches mankind according to the scriptures, the truth about his origin and inseparable relationship with Yahweh Elohim, Yahshua, and the universe, which he, the man, is a part thereof. Okay, pause for one second, Dr. Roberts. So let's let's unpack what she just read. So it says this divine revelation and vision pictorially illustrates, explained herein, was shown to the writer. Now, the first thing we say is to help you find and know Yahweh, and we also say that Dr. Kenley, and we always say this because it's a need to, we say he claimed to have had a panoramic vision. Now, for me, I can say he did because I did my research. Mm -hmm. So that's what you have to do. And that's what he's saying here. He's telling you that through this panoramic vision, it's going to show you how Yahweh is universal spirit law. And it's going to show you through the dispensations and ages. It's going to show you through the law and the prophets and fulfillment. And it's going to use all of these uh, branches of science to prove it. And this is said, it's just a few here. So here, Dr. Kinley is setting us up. The reason we have this section is he's trying to get your mind prepared for what you are about to read. So I know we have a, a newer person, Ilana. He is trying to get you to understand you need to get your mind in the frame of being able to do this quote unquote scientific research. That's why you'll notice that the first part of this says basic psychological preparation. You literally have to be in the mindset to receive what he's about to show you because it's mind blowing. It's nothing the world has ever, ever, ever seen or heard. So now he's telling you about the scriptural and scientific preparation to uh, receive this gospel and the, uh, the things therein. So continue, Dr. Roberts. Do not be deceived. Moreover, this teaching is definitely supported by a divine pattern and plan. Descriptively stipulated in the scriptures of the Holy Bible, and is discreetly confirmed by Yahweh Elohim himself, his incorporeal and corporeal, invisible and visible universal creation, the law and the prophets, Yahshua the Messiah, the apostles, and in part by modern practical or general science. Likewise, this teaching exposes the adversary, Lucifer, and his mysticism or false so-called occult science. Okay, pause. So what he just said in here, we talked about in those seven steps. So Dr. Kinley is telling you he has those that evidence. So one of our seven steps was to do research. So he's giving you the articles that he's going to use so that you can turn around and do your research to say, okay, I see that, or okay, I don't see that. And the reason you have to keep going back, because one of the steps was to go back and research again, is so that he can show it to you and you understand it. Again, in SoundCloud tape 46, Dr. Kenley said, I will count you a fool if you believed anything I said without making me prove it. So he is giving us here the, the tools or the research items that we need to prove what he's teaching us in this book. Okay, continue. Our aim here is to lead you step by step to an indisputable, profound knowledge of Yahweh, our Elohim, and a permanent, conscientious realization of his universal ever presence in whom we live, move, and have our being, and a realistic, 
and comprehensible understanding of his incorporeal and physical manifestations throughout the universe. Okay, pause. So, and I'm, I'm going to read that over because really pay attention because he's telling you, he's going to lead you step by step. So our aim here is to lead you step by step. That's where these steps come in. That's the scientific research. When you do scientific research, it has to be steps, this universal steps. We always use the example of if I ask three people how long a stick is, and they can say three different answers, how are we going to prove how long this, the stick is? We get a ruler. Well, that ruler, in order to get that universal standard of that ruler, it had to go through steps to establish it as the accurate alpha or the base for every other measurement. So that's what Dr. Kenley's telling you here. He is going to take you step by step like you do a child. Okay, baby, we're going to teach you your ABCs and we're going to teach you your one, two, threes. Here's an apple, A. Here's a banana, B. Or here's one apple. Here's a step by step. That's the scientific research when we say that in the moderation. Okay, continue, Dr. Uh, Roberts. It's right here. Before mm -hmm. this gigantic task can be universally accomplished, that is, with sincere appreciation, we must first realize the direct course of procedure by which the invisible Yahweh Elohim chose to create the universe and to make himself fully known as he really is and actually exists. First to Moses as an individual writer and thereafter to mankind collectively. Thereafter, Yahweh Elohim chose to make himself fully known from his inception up to the present time as follows. So pause. So now it's so, it's so pretty. So now Dr. Kelly says before this gigantic task, what gigantic task? of leading you step by step to an indisputable, profound knowledge of Yahweh our Elohim. That's huge because as we talked about on Tuesday, there are more religions or different sects of religions than there are brands of liquor. So he's telling you, he is going to take you by the hand as a schoolmaster, take you step by step so that the knowledge that you get about Yahweh Elohim is indisputable. Meaning when you are face to face with someone else who is questioning this doctrine, who is questioning this, you have a strong foundation to push back. Now, are you going to be able to push back on everything? No, because we're all still learning, but your foundation will be strong enough to where if they do present to you something that you can't um, you can't explain, you don't waver and you don't you don't tip you don't go with the wind and go oh well you know what maybe it's not true you don't do that you go okay Yahweh I know you're gonna show me that I just gotta wait on it or hey I can't answer that question let me go get you a brother and that I think that can mm -hmm. or hey you don't believe me you don't believe what I say go look here go research here that's the universal um, task that he's talking about is huge because we have been inundated in this world and the way the world thinks. Dr. Kinley is trying to undo everything we learned to bring us to a knowledge of Yahweh. And it was often said, and I remember this, Dr. Sheila Carter came to class one time and she works, I forgot, she was working with someone and she said, it's actually easier to teach a child that doesn't know anything than teach an adult the same thing because you have to undo everything that adult learned in order to start from the beginning. That's why when we come to class, it's always beginning at Moses because we have to start from the beginning. No matter what question someone asks you about this gospel, you can't get around starting at Moses because you got to build up that foundation. So it is, it is imperative that we follow the scientific research steps. So it's not just science, it's steps, it's pattern, it's a method that needs to be undertaken to understand this great and beautiful gospel that Yahweh has delivered to us. So I am going to get here. Oh, yes. And those revelations are permanent. Yes. Thank you, Dr. Roberts. So once 
you have taken on the task of learning this step by step. The information that you then receive, you ingest it, it assimilates through your body. You take out all the essential proteins and amino acids of this gospel. It is now a part of you. It is permanent. It is not gone out as waste through your system. Only that crap, that garbage that the world is feeding you, that is what is empty out on the other side. But the essentials of this, the truth of this stays with you and it cannot be erased. That's why it's so important that you know this for yourself and you don't just take what we're saying. I don't care who it is or how long they've been in this class or what their relationship to anybody. You understand this for yourself because it's your soul that is at stake. And none of us are getting in on anybody else's coattails. No matter what you think, it's just not going to happen that way. Okay, so now we're going to go back to our slides. And thank you, Dr. Roberts, for reading that. So that was volume uh, one, page five of the 14 steps. So now we're going to go back to the uh, pamphlet that uh, we talked about that Dr. Lejeune uh, Gill authored. And this subject, this section is on physics. So Dr. Uh, Lewis, if you could read that, please. Mm -hmm. Physics, the branch of science concerned with the nature and properties of matter and energy. The subject matter of physics, distinguished from that of chemistry and biology, includes mechanics, heat, light, and other radiation, sound, electricity, magnetism, and the structure of atoms. Okay, so I, I did not take physics in high school because I was like, I can't do that, but now I wish I had a, but, you know, all things... Being 2020, you know, you you realize later on that if you had known how this pattern operates, there's no subject that you can't conquer once you go by the pattern. Mm -hmm. So, okay, Dr. Lewis, so here is the subject that we're going to go into. Go ahead. Physics in the parhelic circle. Parhelic circle, yes. Okay. All right. Chapter 12, Physics, Section A, the, har the parhelic circle. A parhelic circle a faint white circle or halo, which is parallel to the horizon at the altitude of the sun. Parhelion, a mock sun or bright spot at the altitude of the sun. It is called parhelic circle from the Greek, parhelios, beside the sun. It is caused by reflection on occasions when a sufficient number of brightly reflecting faces of ice crystals are present. At times along the circle, two bright spots may appear as echo images of the sun or moon. One appears to the right of the sun or moon and one to the left of the sun or moon, occurring near the intersection of a 22 degree halo with the parhelic circle. Okay, so pause one second. I'm gonna go back to this other slide so you can see it in color. And this is it. So this is actually a photo that I took because once I uh, read the, the section, I went out and for a walk and Yahweh actually showed me this image and I had never, you see it, but you don't pay attention to it. So mm. this is actually a photo that I took of what they're talking about. So you see here the little uh, spots on the side and one underneath and one at the top, but then you see this halo effect here. Okay, so we'll go back and I think you're starting on the second paragraph. Mm. These ghostly sun images are called parhelia, side suns, or mock suns. Coloration is sometimes observed in these due to the bending of the sun's light by the same ice crystals, ice crystal faces which form the circle. Okay. Yahshua the Messiah is the light of the world, and Satan and his host, mock suns, are the abomination that maketh desolate, Matthew 24 and 15. Mm -hmm. Satan and his host are standing where they ought not, ministers, popes, priests, preachers, Mary. These are set up as mediators between Yahweh and man, rather than Yahshua the Messiah, the one and only true mediator, 1 Timothy 2.5. Satan distorts the truth. He comes to us with all powers and lying wonders, causing us to worship images, mock sons. Satan blinds one to the truth. He stands between Yahweh and man, in whom the God of this age hath blinded the minds of them who believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of the Messiah, who is the image of Elohim, should shine unto them. 
and that's 2 Corinthians 4.4. 4. These brightly reflecting faces of ice crystals are likened unto the satanic host spreading his damnable doctrine and the worship of angels and so-called saints, bringing about strange visions and delusions. All of this is abomination that maketh desolate or void of life. Daniel 11.31, King James Version. This is idolatry, for Yahweh said, Thou shalt have no other Elohims or gods before me. Deuteronomy okay, 5, so mm -hmm. let's pause and un unpack this as well. So here is Yahshua the Messiah is the light of the world. So these mock suns, these images on the sides, when you look at them, if you actually see them in person, like I was able to, they're, they can be really bright. So that is that mockery, that Satan standing where he ought not, trying to be that intercession between you and Yahweh or trying to make himself as he is the actual son when he's not. So that is what you'll see when you look at those. So that's what we're saying here. These are, this is a physical representation of what happened in the spirit. Remember, because everything Yahweh is showing us, he's giving us the, our Romans 1, 19 and 20 so that we can better understand or use our scientific research to understand how things were or are in the spirit. So um, I don't know, Dr. April Lewis, if you can, can you get um, Daniel 11 and 31 for me, please? And we read our scripture lesson was Second Corinthians, the fourth chapter. So we read that. But let's get Daniel uh, 11 and 31. That's Daniel 11 and 31. Mm -hmm. And arms shall stand on his part. And they should go up, Dr. Lewis. I know you'll be able to figure out uh, where to start at. We want to pick up the train of thought, please. Okay. I'll start at 30. Okay. For the ships of Shittim shall come against him. Therefore, he shall be grieved and return and have indignation against the Holy Covenant. So shall he do. He shall even return and have intelligence with them that forsake the Holy Covenant. An arm shall stand on his part and they shall pollute the sanctuary of strength and shall take away the daily sacrifice, and they shall place the abomination that maketh desolate. Mm -hmm. So that's Satan and his host making this sacred tabernacle, making it abominable. They, you know, the Yahshua went in there and over, overturned the money changers tables because they were selling, you know, sacrifices to people and then you had some of the priests that would take part of the person's sacrifices for themselves. It was just, they were making it an abomination when it was something holy to bring your sacrifice or your, your, your conscience or your heart unto Yahweh. So they made it desolate. So these mock sons here are just the uh, physical representation of Satan and his host trying to be the most high or trying to be like the most high. So that I believe that might be the end, but I just want to show you. So they were, she was talking about some of this in her um, discourse there. And these are just some of the particles that you see and where they are. Now, as I was reading through this, I was asking Yahweh, okay, Yahweh, help me to understand because again, physics was not my thing. Um, but just to um, go over it a little bit, he's just showing you that there are three parts to these Mark sons. And of course it has to be three parts because it goes by the pattern. And you have these three here and I'll have Dr. Lewis read it. I won't go into further explanation of it because this part Yahweh still having me understand more specifically, I want him to um, help me to understand and to get to know a little bit about the numbers that are represented here, but go ahead and read Dr. Lewis. Okay, circumzenithal arc. A near zenith, colorful half circle with a vertex about 48 degrees above the sun. It has bright colors with red on the lower outside of the arc and violet on the upper inside. This arc occurs only when the elevation of, excuse me, only when the elevation of the light source, for example, the sun, is less than 30, 32 degrees. So pause right there. So what he, uh, the this one part he had me see was okay. Yahshua died on the cross at, at 32, 32 and a half. 
So it's saying you only see this, which is, is almost looks like an upside down uh, rainbow. You only see that when the sun is less than 32 degrees in the horizon. So I was like, okay, Yahweh, I know that has to do with something. I can't say what it is, but that, of course, that 32 stuck out. And it, those things, those numbers should, certain numbers should stick out in your mind. So go ahead and read the next one, Dr. Lewis. Mm -hmm. Tangent arc. For the 22 degree halo, the lower tangent arc is normally below the horizon when the sun or moon are within 22 degrees of the horizon. So it can only be seen from a high location, such as on a mountain, in diamond dust, or from an aircraft in deeper cirrus clouds. I think I actually mixed these two up. It might be, yeah. So the tan the lower tangent art is what you just read. This next one that he's gonna read is actually the tangent art. So go ahead and read this one, Dr. Oh. Lewis. Dr. Lewis. All right. All right, so the one I read was actually tangent. Okay, gotcha. Yeah, yep. Yeah. Sorry, here you go. Okay. All right. So this is tangent art. Tangent yeah. art. A type of atmospheric optical phenomenon, halo that appears above and below the observed sun or moon as a as tangent to the 22 degree halo. Mm -hmm. To generate these arcs, the long axis of the rod shaped hexagonal ice crystals must be horizontally aligned. Okay, again, <laughs> I didn't completely understand it, but I wanted to get all any information about these these uh, circles or these uh, sun dogs that that she calls it. Mm -hmm. So um, one of the things that um, I was so grateful to Yahweh for because this, as you can see, that was a short section in this book, and I asked Yahweh, okay, Yahweh, is some of this I don't understand. So one of the things that, um, and here's another picture, as you can see, you can really see it very clearly. Someone else took that picture, but one of the things I had never understood was not just the speed of light, but a light year. So Yahweh in his mercy and grace allowed me to understand it. So I want to try and, because this is physics, that's what we're on now. We're talking physics. So remember at the beginning, we talked about uh, um, Einstein's theory of relativity. Now it's two parts. This is one part, which is E equals MC squared. We all know that we've all heard it, but what does it mean? So go ahead and read Dr. Lewis. E equals MC squared. Energy equals mass times the speed of light squared. On the most basic level, the equation says that energy and mass matter are interchangeable. They are different forms of the same thing. So what they're saying, so here is you got energy, right? Then you got mass times the speed of light, which is the C, and you square that. So that is the equation. Now, that's part of the theory of relativity. Again, that theory has been proven. We just hang on to that word theory. Okay, continue to read, Dr. Lewis. Speed of light equals 186,000 miles per second. Thus, a light year is the distance light can travel in a year, 5.88 trillion miles. So let's take that. So if, this, if light can travel 186,000 miles per second, then you multiply that times years where, well, you know, you got to go to 60 seconds and then all that. But you come out with a light year equaling 5.88 trillion miles. OK, continue. Mm -hmm. The equivalent would be traveling around the world 7.5 times in one second. So that's how fast the speed of light goes. It can travel around the entire Earth 7.5 times in a second. OK, continue. Mm -hmm. The, the equation is used to convert the amount of mass in any object to the energy it would produce if converted to pure energy. So one of the um, one of the resources that I use is PBS.org. And we all know PBS, you know, from our childhood, Sesame Street, all of that. But um, the equation, what the equation is saying is that if you take any object that has mass, it could be a paperclip. And this is one of the examples they use and you convert it to energy, the amount of that energy is so immense that it's just, um, I think one example they use is it is greater than an atomic bomb. And so let me get, um, if I can, let me go over to another screenshot because again, I want to, what Yahweh tasks us with when we're presenting these things is to get our evidence, to get our proof, right? 
And so that's what we need to do. So let me do a new screen share here really quickly because I wanna show you one of the um, articles that I use. So another um, source that I like to go to is NOVA. And a lot of you, if you watch TV, you know NOVA is all about science. So here uh, they're talking about this whole, um, this uh, E equals MC squared. So I'm gonna have Dr. Lewis read um, right here, Dr. Lewis, start here. All right. Why then do you have to square the speed of light? It has to do with the nature of energy. When something is moving four times as fast as something else, it doesn't have four times the energy, but rather six times, 16 times the energy. In other words, that figure is squared. So the speed of light squared is the conversion factor that decides just how much energy lies within a walnut or any other chunk of matter. And because the speed of light is, excuse me, and because the speed of light squared is a huge number. Can't even, yeah. Is it a trillion, ahead. 90 trillion <laughs> kilometers squared? Right. The amount of energy bound up into even the smallest mass is truly mind boggling. Okay, continue down here. Here's an example. If you could turn every one of the atoms in a paperclip into pure energy, leaving no mass whatsoever, the paperclip, paperclip would yield 18 kilotons of TNT. That's roughly the size of the bomb that destroyed Hiroshima in 1945. On Earth, however, there is no practical way to convert a paperclip or any other object entirely to energy. It would require temperatures and pressures greater than those at the core of our sun. Okay, so I had him read that because think about what it just said. If you could take the mass that is in a paper clip and convert it to pure energy, it would be greater than the bomb that was dropped in Japan. Just think about that. So when I think about that, I think of the power of pure spirit. That's what comes to me. And we talked about, we often talk about the power of the sun and how the true sun makes that sun darker than a thousand midnights. I mean, it's, it's really mind boggling when you think about it. So now let's let's look at a little bit more. So go, let's think about the spiritual significance of this E equals MC squared. Go ahead, Dr. Lewis. Spiritual significance of E equals MC squared. Energy equals mass times the speed of light squared. On the most basic level, the equation says that energy and mass matter are interchangeable. They are different forms of the same thing. So what do we always say about Yahweh? Elohim and Yahshua. They're not three separate. They are the same. So that is Yahweh in pure spirit. That's your, that's your, your, um, that's your mass that's greater than Hiroshima, right? That if you, that pure spirit is just has the power and the energy that can't be comprehended. That number that, you know, Dr. Lewis or neither I or anyone else I could think could even explain what that number was, 90, whatever. That's that pure spirit state of Yahweh. That's that pure energy, pure spirit. Then that pure spirit or energy takes on an incorporeal shape and form that can only be seen in divine visions and revelation. So it's starting to come down so that pure energy is starting to condense. And then that pure energy comes down even further. Now it's solid matter. So that's that paper clip. So you flip that back around, you take that little bitty paper clip and you start to take it and pull out nothing but the energy that is contained in that paper clip. And you eventually end up back at that powerful, pure spirit. That's the significance, the spiritual significance of energy equals mass times the speed of light. I mean, when Yahweh showed me this, I was like, oh my gosh, now I finally understand it. Yahweh in his pure spirit state the reason no one has ever seen him, first of all, because we're contained within him, right? You can't get outside him to look. But there is so much energy and power. Well, not in him. He is that energy. He is that power that exists to the point where you could not comprehend it. As Dr. Kinley said, you you know, to sit there. And I, I, I don't remember which one it is. I think we had a little kind of a, a fun argument before um, Dr. Brazil, when we talked about uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark, it was the one where it was Raiders of the Lost Ark and the Crystal Skull. So remember in that one, 
when they found these these beings, right? And they were all around in this circle. And the the lady that was, you know, the 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 antagonist, she was said, I want to know everything, you know, and you can't, you just can't because you would explode. And that's what happened with her. It's like, no, you you cannot know everything because Yahweh is just that he is so massive and so much. That's why we're going to be learning the agents to come. And that's why he has to give it to us piecemeal because we just can't deal with that amount of knowledge and that amount of power. And that's that's portrayed in Deuteronomy 6 and 4 when we talk about Yahweh being a unity. So, you know, this whole equation is, you know, energy and mass are one and the same. That's what he's telling you. They're not interchangeable. They're, they are the same thing energy and mass are the same you just take something that has mass you pull it out and make it pure energy and then it's more powerful than it was in its uh, physical state don't we know that's how Yahweh is Yahshua the Messiah is Yahweh contained in that specially prepared body but that was Yahweh himself that was all that energy all that exists was in that body and that's also picked up in First John 5 and 7 about that three that bear record in heaven. The Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit, they're one. They're not different. So that's what Einstein's theory was. What science didn't know, but that we know because we are the sons of Yahweh and because he chose to reveal it to us, we know that's actually talking about the unity of the Spirit. That's really all that equation is talking about. And it is so pretty when Yahweh really gives you the ability to understand it. So now we're going to go into another one. Go ahead, um, Dr. Lewis. And this is the one, this is what got me um, because I, I told you, I, I just couldn't understand um, this whole thing with the Hubble telescope and them saying, you know, something was 38 million light years. I'm like, what the heck is a light year? You know, all I think is a buzz light year from, you know, Toy Story. What is a light year? So I had to do my research and all be all the glory and honor given to Yahweh that he allowed me to see it. So go ahead and, and read Dr. Lewis. Mm -hmm. spiritual spiritual significance of the speed of light i'm sorry speed of light equals 186,000 miles per second mm -hmm. matthew 3 15 and yahshua answering said unto him suffer it to be so now for thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness mm -hmm. luke 24 47 and beginning at moses and all the prophets he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself Okay, so Paul, so what Yahweh had me do here is with, we know that Yahshua the Messiah, the Law and the Prophets was his autobiography that was written before he was born. So when he was born, he had to fulfill everything in the Law and the Prophets. So what was in the Law and the Prophets? Continue to read, Dr. Lewis. The scriptures are the 39 books of the Old Testament. There are 929 chapters. There are 33,214 verses. There are 503,493 words. Yahshua mm -hmm. died at 33 years of age. He began his ministry at the age of 30. Thus, he had to fulfill his autobiography. Can you scroll back up? I can't. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, I'm not. It, it, yeah, it's not you. Somebody joined. And I don't know. Oh, gotcha. Sorry. My screen changed. Okay, I see. Okay. Nice. Okay. All right. I'll read. Start over. Yahshua okay. died at thirty-three years of age. He began his ministry at the age of thirty. Thus, he had to fulfill his autobiography, which is the Old Testament, within that three-year period. Okay. So here's where it just whew, it blew my mind. I was just like levitating. So if we're saying the speed of light was one hundred and eighty-six thousand miles per second, and we talk about this all the time, we say Yahshua the Messiah was moving at the speed of light. What are you talking about? So we know what the speed of light is. That's that equation. Can I interject using. something? Yes, go ahead. Speed of light is 186,400. That's the number of the three tribes where the sun rises from the east, Judah, Zebulun, and Issachar. Mm -hmm. That's in the textbook somewhere, too. It's 186,400. Mm -hmm. Is the speed of you can Google it or look in any kind of uh, truth about measurements. Okay. One hundred eighty-six thousand four hundred, and they okay. were the ones that, wherever the cloud or pillar fire raised up, they were the first ones to 
lead all 12 tribes in the tabernacle. Right. 186 right. 4. I don't know okay. where that comes from, but that's the exact <laughs> speed of light. Actually, specifically, it was the tribe of Levi and it's in the scriptures. The exact. Mm -hmm. it, uh, okay, and mm -hmm. also, Numbers 2 and 9 add those three tribes up to 186 400. Mm -hmm. The three okay. sons of Jacob, Judah, Issachar, and Zebulun, the fourth, fifth, and sixth sons. They're told age of 20 and up. That's the numbers two and nine. 186, four. And they rose up with the sun. Oh, the sun rise from the east. They were on the east side of the tabernacle. Mm -hmm. That's okay. mother's So I stuff. will. Mm -hmm. It's also in the textbook. I just mm -hmm. can't recall where it is. The 80, 186, four. Okay. So I, and this is, once again, this is a school. So all the research I did, it was 186, but I'm going to go back and once, what was the seven steps? You research again. So I am going to do that. And I appreciate that, Dr. Yule, because again, this is a school. We cannot be above correction. So I really do appreciate that. And it makes sense to me. So I'm going to go back and do my research. And I advise all of you to do the same. Uh, the principal point on this one is how fast Yahshua was moving to fulfill everything that was in these 929 chapters of the Old Testament. He had to do this in three in a three-year period. So he was moving so fast that you wouldn't be able to see. And that's what we say. That's why we say the speed of light, you can't see it. Um, the light of the sun, they said by the time the light of the sun reaches us, it's eight minutes old because it takes because we're so far away, but it's still traveling at the speed of light, but it takes eight minutes to get to us. So it just, it gives you a kind of a reference point to how fast light can travel. So here, let's let's read this section, Dr. Lewis. Uh, I'm sorry. Mm, that's okay. The law of physics makes it impossible for a person to travel at the speed of light. Why? Because we are bound by space and time. Yahshua was a specially prepared body. Not only was his body the container for the blood that would grant us salvation, but it was the only body that could and did travel at the speed of light. Yahweh is not bound by space or time. Space and time are contained within him. Let's watch this short video to get a sense of how fast Yahshua was moving to accomplish our salvation. Okay, so let me see if I can do this without switching my screen. One second. So, okay, pause, and I'm going to have to switch my screen. I didn't think I would have to. I will, so give me one second. Let me share. Here we go. All right. Okay. Let me know if you can see this. So this is just showing you what it would look like if you traveled at the speed of light. That was it. <laughs> so if I go back, because, you know, when he first started this, he's saying, no, this is not even close. So I'm going to do that one more time. This is what it would look like. Okay, that was around the earth in one second at the speed of light. So again, it's just giving you a reference point and, and helping you to understand in a physical way how fast Yahshua the Messiah was moving when he was accomplishing and fulfilling all the things that were written in the law and the prophets. So um, I mentioned the James Webb telescope and we know that um, um, this telescope was um, developed to peer back into space. So um, I have been following the telescope from the time they started um, uh, advertising or publishing the information about it till now, and it's just amazing, the pictures. But there were four main objectives for this telescope, and go ahead and read those objectives, Dr. Lewis. James Webb tel Telescope, four main objectives. One, the first light of the universe. 
So their goal is to find the first light that ever existed in the universe. Go ahead. Two, the assembly of galaxies in the early universe. So how did galaxies form? Go ahead. Three, the birth of stars and protoplanetary systems. Again, how did those things start and form? Four, the planets, including the origins of life. And Dr. Ardeen, Dr. Marvin Lewis also uh, always talked about, especially when the Hubble was still the telescope, about what they're trying to do is they're trying to find life. They're trying to find how was life created, when was it created, what, you know, the whole Big Bang Theory. And I never could understand it because I'm like, how is looking how is looking at the far ends of space, how is that going to tell you anything? Well, when you think about the whole equation we just talked about, which is um, how far light travels and the speed of light. So what they're saying is if, if light takes eight minutes to get from the sun to us, then that means if you go to Jupiter, if you go further out to Pluto, the light that the James Webb picks up, it took some years for the James Webb to see that light because that light is traveling towards the James Webb. So in their mind, if they can peer, the further back they can go, that means the further back in time that they're going. That's that whole concept that I didn't understand that Yahweh and his mercy and grace allowed me to understand. So let's look at this James Webb telescope because I had to you know, research who the heck is James Webb? Why are we naming the telescope after him and all this other stuff? But when you think about this, the telescope as compared to the Hubble, this is the picture of it. So this is the Hubble, it had one primary mirror. Now you have the James Webb and here we're gonna look at the makeup of this James Webb telescope. So go ahead and read Dr. Lewis. The James Webb telescope, who is James Webb? And that's something you can look up for yourself because it's it's just a guy that died a long time ago that was really good in, in science and astronomy. Go ahead. 18 six-sided hexagonal mirrors. So these are the mirrors that make up the James Webb telescope. Instead of this one big mirror, there are 18. Go mm -hmm. ahead. Number six represents the flesh. Sixth step in the tabernacle is the second veil. So each of these are hexagons, right? Hexagon has six sides. Now it's talking about it's 18 of these six-sided mirrors. So again, Satan always, always, always falls short of the glory of Yahweh. That's why you have here that number six. So we see here the sixth step in the tabernacle is the second veil. Remember, Satan was kicked out of heaven and he keeps trying to get back. So when you do that, when you do that configuration, he's here in heaven. Remember, he said he would be above the most high, so he would uh, be above the mercy seat. So here is Satan. He's he's knocked down and he tries to get back, but he can't get back until that and past that second veil. So that forms that six. That's why six equals the flesh or carnality, but that's a mark that's on Satan. So when we look at the names. Um, and we do this oftentimes in class. You have Yahweh, Elohim, Yahshua. You have Lord God and Jesus Christ. Even those, because Yahweh is a pattern and all things go by the pattern, even those will give you a glimpse of who is what. So continue to read, Dr. Lewis. Sorry. Yahweh, El Yahweh plus Elohim plus Yahshua, 19. Equals should be equal. Yeah, I'm sorry. Equals 19. Lord plus God plus Jesus Christ equals 18, or three times six, 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 six. Satan will always fall short of the glory of Yahweh. So Yahweh, he's always, he's always short. He all, he tries to be. So this James Webb telescope, what they're doing, they are trying to find the beginning of the universe. And they often say that, you'll actually hear them say that. And then some of the images, and I'm telling you, these images are just powerful. One of the images is actually uh, my desktop, but these images are just beautiful. And what it reminds me of is that this is my desktop. It's called the Pillars of Creation. Um, what you'll notice is that the clarity that they have versus the Hubble. So they have some of these images. They have uh, one side is the Hubble with that image and the other side is the James Webb. The James Webb 
is clearer and clearer. And what that is telling us is that Yahweh, because we know we are in the grace, in the last seconds of this um, divine grace period, Yahweh is making things clearer and clearer to his sons. So these, these images, as beautiful as they are, and sometimes I look at them and I just get tears in my eyes because I'm thinking, okay, the creation is Yahweh's way of showing us his beauty, but his creation, no matter how beautiful it is, cannot compare to the beauty that we are going to experience when we take off these bodies and we are one with Yahshua. So when he's showing us these things as his sons, when we see these things and how beautiful they are, take that for what it's worth. Oh my goodness, Joshua, you're telling me we're going to experience things from a, a spiritual standpoint that are, e that are even more beautiful than this universe itself. Absolutely, positively you are. That's why it's so important to do your scientific research, do your, do your uh, studying, ask Yahweh to show you what it is that he wants you to see. Because when you think about it, when you look here, this photo, I remember them talking about this photo in particular. And all of these, let me see if I can get these to go away just a little bit, just so I can show you. All of these, all of these here that you see that are a little bit bigger, all those are galaxies. So we live in the Milky Way galaxy and we have billions of stars in our galaxy. So now they're looking, they're like, Oh my goodness, there are billions of galaxies. So you have here the the um the enormity of Yahweh and the the mat the the eternity of Yahweh. I can't even words can't I can't even get the words to describe how it makes me feel when I see these because Yahweh allows me to put the spiritual on it and to say you think you're seeing something now, just wait until you are in the body of Yahshua the Messiah and you are an experience in these things and you are learning about him in ages to come. So this James Webb telescope, even though the makeup of it is, is um, kind of signifying or it brings back to the satanic spirit and that's because he's trying to emulate Yahweh. He's trying to be better than Yahweh. But what it's doing is revealing to us the power that Yahweh has in this gospel. So this whole thing about science and the creation and the scientific method, it is meant to give you a step-by-step. -step. And yeah, and Dr. Kinley says that in that, in that book, page five, volume one, a step-by-step -step way to learn about him and then to have a um, how did Dr. Uh, Roberts say? He said a permanent realization of his ever presence and his power. That's what Yahweh is doing. So if he has allowed you to come into this class and to remain and to keep asking questions, count yourself blessed because he has not done that for everyone. He's only doing this for his sons. So we want to be counted worthy as one of his sons so that we can get to experience this beauty on a different plane than what the world understands or sees it by. So um, that is all I had. And um, I think Dr. Brazil, yeah, she said it's numbers two and nine that describes the tribe of Judah alone numbered 186,400. So thank you for that, um, Dr. Brazil. No, it includes, it includes all three of the tribes of that added up. Judah, we should Isabel read it. And Zebulun, read yeah, it. Numbers, numbers two and nine. Um, numbers two and nine, please. Read from three to nine. Numbers three, two, three to nine. Okay, so start at three. Thank you, Doctor Lewis. I'm in chapter two of Numbers. Yep. Yes, please. Okay, yeah. Numbers two and three. Mm -hmm. And on the east side, toward the rising of the sun. Shall they of the standards of the camp of Judah pitch throughout their armies? And Nashan, the son of Amadab, shall be captain of the children of Judah. And his hosts and those that were numbered of them were threescore and 14,600. So and, a score is 20. Okay, go ahead. Mm -hmm. And his hosts 
and those that were numbered of them were three score and 14,600, excuse me, <laughs> and those that do pitch next unto him shall be the tribe of Issachar and Nathaniel, the son of Zorah, shall be captain of the children of Issachar. And his hosts and those that were numbered thereof were fifty and four thousand and four hundred. Then the tribe of Zebulon and Eliab and the son and the son of Helam shall be captain of the children of Zebulon, and his hosts and those that were numbered thereof were fifty and seven thousand and four hundred. And all that were numbered in the camp of Judah were in hundred thousand and four score thousand and six thousand and four hundred throughout their armies. These shall first set forth. Now those three are the ones that are counted. One, 186, 400. That's what that adds up to. I bet my life on it. So that's mm -hmm. all scriptures, the Hebrew Bible, Torah. Some of them break down the scores into the 60s, 2060. Mm -hmm. That's how many there were. And they are the first son. You read, um, whenever the, the tabernacle moved, there in the east, and, it, and the sun rise in the east, whenever that Pillow of fire by night. If it was moving at night, they were the first ones to move. And just one thing simple. And mm -hmm. John, the first chapter, just tell you, Yahshua is the light of the world. So he's got to move and fulfill all those things <laughs> that's in the that's scripture. Right. But right. It's in the textbook, too. I don't know exactly mm -hmm. where it's at. 186, mm -hmm. 400. Okay. Again, this is a school. You Do your Google homework. You can, everybody can Google it for themselves. Right. Do your homework. Don't take yep. my word for it. Yep, that's right. Do it to this yourself. Is a school. Yep. Yep. Do your homework class, please. This is again, that was the whole point of the start of this. Do your homework. Prove it for yourself. Don't just sit back and listen and, and take what we say as face value. Do your own research. That's the only way anything can become real to you. If you research it yourself and then Yahweh shows it to you. So um, uh, at this time, I'm going to turn it back over to our moderator. And moderator, you can just use the first name. Thank you. That was mm -hmm. awesome and so enlightening. Mm -hmm. I'm sure we all got something out of it. And it gives me great pleasure to call as our speaker for tonight the president of our Madison, Wisconsin class, Dr. Sasha. Give me a second. Uh, good evening, brethren. Good evening. Good evening. Yeah, it took me by surprise. <laughs> but, uh, I'm happy to be here, and uh, I'm happy to give a reasonable testimony. I think I was called because I'm I'm a scientist. Yes, sir. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I'm not in the science of physics, so uh, it was uh, interesting, but uh, uh, it's uh, it's not the science which uh, I'm doing, but. Uh, it was, um, I think it's very important and uh, for us to understand the uh, relevance of science to what we are studying in this school. And I really liked the introduction of um, the first speaker about science in general. And that's what was in my mind to go over just a couple things uh, as far as science uh, goes. Now, we say in uh, moderation that this is a religious and scientific research organization. 
now it's religious uh, because we are studying uh, the things concerning our creator, Yahweh Elohim. So it's not religious because we, you know, we really have to define words because in the world religion most often associated with the uh, kind of official religions where you have to go to the churches and you have to do certain uh, ceremonies. So we, uh, this kind of formal religion, we, it's not a formal religion. The religion aspect is just aspect uh, concerning our creator because we worship our creator not by our physical um, efforts, by our hands, by uh, kneeling down, by uh, uh, using candles in the churches, by water baptism, by Lord's suppers, but we worship him in spirit and in truth. So to worship him in truth, we do need to know the truth. And that's where the scientific aspect uh, is coming from, because it's a religious and scientific research organization. Well, let's, uh, let's kind of research what it means, because when you talk to the people, let me uh, take myself, for example. When I would talk to the people and I talk to uh, Russian Christians online, trying to introduce uh, them to this beautiful teaching, and uh, often uh, you hear their, uh, uh, the response, I mean, the, you know, why, why are you talking about the scientific science? Why are you talking about research? Because the faith in God, as they call him, and science, they really contradict to each other. There are two different uh, areas. It's, they're not connected. Where, where will you find in the Bible, they would uh, say. Where is in the Bible? It says that you need to do some research, some investigation. Well, actually, it is in the Bible. So let's go to, um, let's go first to First Thessalonians 5, and I think it's 21. That's First Thessalonians. Five and 21. Prove all things. Hold fast that which is good. Right. So it says, prove all things and hold fast that which is good. Now, I don't know if uh, somebody um, uh, has a uh, strong concordance because part of the science is to go and find out the origin or the meaning of the words. Does somebody have a strong concordance to look up words? I do. So I would you please look up person. the meaning of proof here? Okay. Uh, that's 5 and 21. And in Strong's, that is number 1381. And here it means allow, I'm sorry, by implication to approve, allow, discern, examine. Anything more? Um, no, that's all I have in this Strong's. Oh, okay. Uh, like. So it, it's uh, examine in, uh, mm -hmm. I think in my Strong's I also saw yes. investigate mm -hmm. uh, there. So it's examine, investigate. Try. So what uh, 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 Dr. Kinley uh, said in the moderation because he wrote the moderation, it's not uh, goes against the Bible. It's supported by the Bible. And therefore, as uh, the first speaker said, he always said, you know, I had a vision and revelation from the creator. Let me prove it to your satisfaction. He always wanted us to go and to check out the things that he was teaching and how we would do it. We would go to the law, to the prophets, we would go to encyclopedias and dictionaries. And in this case, we are going to the meaning of um, Hebrew or Greek, in this case, words. Now, 
please go to uh, Hebrews because another principle in the book, it's very important principle and I will go into it as well. Uh, it's talking about two or three witnesses. So let's uh, find another witness. Let's go to the book of Hebrews uh, chapter 11 and read verse 6, please. Well, actually, please read verse uh, first, verse 1. Yes, Hebrews 11 and 1. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. So it's already scientific term here as applied to faith because faith is evidence mm -hmm. of things hoped for. Now, uh, 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 skip down to verse 6, please. 6 verse. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to Yahweh must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Right. So he who comes to Yahweh first must believe that he really is. Therefore, in classes, especially in, uh, uh, for first-time visitors, for returning visitors, we present evidence how everything is uh, threefold, like atom and cell, and how everything is pointing out to the supernal nature of our Creator, who is Yahweh, Elohim, Yasha, or abstract, intermediate, concrete. And we give a witness after witness, so people will have evidence, and they will know that Yahweh really is. But that's one part. First, we have to uh, know, not to guess, not to speculate, which I did before coming to class. I wanted to believe that God is real. And I liked what I was reading in the Bible when I was introduced to the Bible when I came to this country. Before that, until like 32 years old, I didn't see any Bible because it was prohibited in Soviet Russia. But uh, I liked reading about the Bible, about God, but I really didn't have evidence that God was real. So I had to come to this class and people introduced me to the different kind of evidences in the Bible and including science and including everything around the universe, uh, everything pointing out to this threefold nature of our creator, which I don't want to take time right now because I want to do go to something else. I'm still on this verse um, in Hebrews. So he who comes to Yahweh must believe, first believe that he is, and he is a rewarder of, those, of uh, them who diligently seek him. Now, mm -hmm. please look up for diligent, diligently in Strong's. Okay, let me find it. What scripture would that be to Dr. It's Hebrews 11.6. 11, 11.6, 11, okay. So Hebrews 11.6. So diligent would be, that is, and Strong's, that is uh, 1567, and that is to search out, that is, figurative, investigate, to crave, demand, um, right. seek so invest after, careful. Mm -hmm. Right. To seek after, to investigate, mm -hmm. to demand. Mm -hmm. So therefore, it's a, a religious and scientific research organization where we investigate the existence of the invisible creator uh, to understand his uh, uh, purpose. Mm -hmm. So it's really supported you know, by, uh, by the Bible. And uh, many people in the world don't understand it because they were raised in the traditions saying that the Bible and the science contradict to each other. Now you can see this green chart before it and we can go to every aspect uh, on this chart as uh, people do during this science uh, lectures. And uh, uh, we probably all heard the lecture about the body and tabernacle, it's all science. Could you show me 
really quick the Baldwin Metaver Network chart. Yes. Mm -hmm. So I'm not going to go over this uh, chart because to go over it, it really, really, really will I'll need to have more time. But we show how the physiology, anatomy and the physiology of uh, the human body correlates with the tabernacle pattern. And why it uh, correlates with the tabernacle pattern? Because the tabernacle is the uh, shadow and reflection of Yahweh or heavenly things, as it says in uh, Hebrews uh, 8 and 5. And the man is made in the likeness and image of the creator. So because they both reflect the invisible creator, they have to correlate to each other. It, this is science. And this is a very simple science. We can, uh, we all can understand. But look at that this tabernacle pattern as we learn in this class, it was shown to Moses in the vision, and it was described in the Bible 3,500 years ago. Now, this anatomy and physiology of the human body was known uh, like really in the last uh, 100 years, not to say less than 50 years when people learn about uh, pituitary gland hormones and how many hormones are there. And right. I'm not talking about uh, uh, molecular biology and genetics, which people are learning only now, but on, mm. on the molecular biological level, on genetic level, will still, uh, it still correlates with the tabernacle pattern. And, uh, you know, it would be interesting to go in there and uh, uh, look uh, uh, into it. So science do confirm the Bible. Now, uh, in the Bible, it says by the mouth of two or three witnesses, let the truth be established. Let's read it, for example, in Deuteronomy 19.15. That's Deuteronomy 19 and 15. One witness shall not rise up against the man for any iniquity or for any sin and any sin that he sinneth at the mouth of two witnesses or at the mouth of three witnesses shall the matter be established. Right. And so why this is the case, why it's on the mouth, in the mouth of two witnesses or uh, three witnesses, could you show me, please, the chart you were showing before uh, representing the unity of uh, Yahweh, where Yahweh mm -hmm. is de depicted like in a, yeah, that's the one. So because Yahweh in the pure spirit has, uh, uh, who is invisible, has two witnesses. One is Yahweh Elohim in an intermediate shaping form. It's a witness. And another one is uh, Yahshua or Yahweh in the physical body. So he has two witnesses. And if you take the father as the witness by himself, you will find three witnesses. So as a reflection, we have in the Bible two witnesses in Isaiah 8 and 20, uh, Isaiah or Yahweh through Isaiah telling us to go to the law, which is first five books of the Bible, and to the prophets or other books of the Old Testament. There are two witnesses in the Bible. And there is also a third witness in the Bible, which is the fulfillment by Yahshua, the Messiah, the so-called New Testament of the Bible. Now, do you know that this is a very important scientific principle as well? So I've been uh, in science. I was in the beginning of the lecture, I was calculating, thinking. I think it's like about 47 or 48 years I've, uh, I've been a scientist. And uh, the first thing you learn uh, when you start doing science, and it still holds true, although people are trying to kind of escape from this rule, is that you need two or three witnesses, meaning if you do the experiment, let's see, in my research, I'm, uh, uh, I'm doing cancer research, I'm uh, treating cancer, in animals, in mice. And uh, so the way we find or treat uh, cancer 
in mice. Then we move to the clinical trials and um, hoping to help people who are suffering with cancer. So if you find a substance, let's say, and you uh, treat cancer in mice with the substance, you do this experiment and you uh, uh, treat a, a bunch of animals and it's successful, you cannot move it to the clinical trial. You cannot say, uh, Eureka, I found the cure for cancer. No, you have to repeat this experiment at least once. You have to at least have two witnesses, better three witnesses or even more witnesses or so. Because then, because if you do it one time, it may be, uh, you know, something uh, uh, not related to Absolutely. this particular substance. It's uh, some error may uh, happen. So that's a very uh, important law in the science. Now people trying to escape it because now everything is, like, is accelerating as we know in everything else. And people need to get money for their research and therefore they don't have much time to repeat these experiments and they're trying to get away with doing experiments only once. I know that because I review grant proposals from other scientists and you know some scientists just trying for uh, for the sake of time you know go there but as a as a reviewer i cannot let it go because it has to be two or three witnesses you cannot uh, it's it's really important in science so another thing is uh, which what is important in science that the experiment has to be controlled. So what do I mean by that? Again, let's say, you know, there is a bunch of uh, mice in my uh, field of research who have cancer and I give them a certain substance and I want to find out if the substance can uh, eliminate this tumor or cure the tumor. I cannot have just this group of mice, give them the substance, substance and if the tumors go away, I can say, look, I found the cure for cancer. I have to have a control group. In this case, control group will be the group of mice with a similar size of uh, tumors, which will be treated uh, or injected, not with this substance I am investigating, but with uh, something we call it like saline or something which doesn't have any biological activity like placebo, we call it in science. And we have to compare one group to another group. So let me give you an example of how it's important in what we are uh, doing in one of the aims of the schools about uh, studying uh, comparative uh, religions and trying to avoid uh, the deception of uh, Satan. Mm -hmm. I don't know about you, but... Uh, uh, at least before pandemic times, I was visited by Jehovah's Witnesses. I was visited by Mormons. And uh, I like talking to people about religion and I try to talk to them about class. But when I was visited with Mormons, if you know about Mormons, uh, the founder was Joseph Smith, who said he had a vision uh, from God and he wrote a book of Mormons. So they have their own Bible called the Book of Mormons which I read, by the way, and in my opinion, and of course, it's not only my opinion, it's like a, uh, some kind of a plagiarism of uh, the King James Bible, of the Old Testament of the Bible. But um, these people are very sincere, I'm talking about Mormons, and I asked one of them when they came to me, I asked the elder, how do you know that the Book of Mormons is the true book because they actually value this book even above the Bible. Kind of similar to the Bible, but you know, they, it's kind of have their preference because it was written later than the Bible. So I asked this question, how do you know? Now you remember Dr. Kinley said, well, let me prove it to your satisfaction. Mm -hmm. Let me prove it to you by the Bible. You know what this uh, Mormon told me? He told me, that's what I did. And he told me to do the same thing. He said, he's talking about himself. Well, when uh, I wanted to know if this 
uh, Book of Mormon is true, I ask God to lead me to understand it. So I closed my eyes. I put my hand on the Book of Mormons uh, and I uh, prayed to God to show me if it's a true book or not. And he had a very nice feeling in his heart. And by having this feelings, he understood that it was revealed to him by God that this is the true book. Mm. Now, this is a very emotional response which happens mm -hmm. to many people in the church, but it's not a scientific way. Mm. The scientific way is there is no control. What would be the control? Well, let's have it two or three witnesses. Let's take this person who was introduced to the Book of Mormons and let's have this Book of Mormons. Let's have, a, let's say, Romeo and Juliet by Shakespeare. And let's say, sorry for using this example, uh, Mein Kampf by Hitler. Mm -hmm. And let this person, you know, close eyes so he doesn't know what book is that and ask him to put the hand on each of these books and see which one of them will cause this, you know, warm feelings in his heart. Right. <laughs> and uh, I think you know the answer, you know, mm -hmm. to this. You know, it's in 30% uh, chances, scientifically speaking. So that's... that's uh, you know, the science is important to determine. I'm looking how many, how much time I have left. Yeah, uh, nine nine nice. of them. So let me, uh, let me uh, give you two or three examples about the importance um, of the witnesses. As far as the name goes, because we teach about the name of Yahweh. We teach that the name is important. And again, I talk to the people and I know what kind of arguments uh, they uh, make. So as we know uh, in this class, the name of Yahweh, which is the true name of the creator, was hidden by um, uh, religious Jews in about 500 BC. They stopped pronouncing this name because they decided that this name is too sacred to pronounce. But do you know why they did it? Uh, please, uh, because I will need your help with Strong's, please okay. uh, go to Exodus 3.15 and read Exodus 3.15. Exodus 3.15. <clears throat> Excuse me. And Elohim said moreover unto Moses, Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, Yahweh, the Elohim of your fathers, the Elohim of Abraham, the Elohim of Isaac, and the Elohim of Jacob hath sent me unto you. This is my name forever, and this is my memorial unto all generations. Right, so it seems to be clear. Yahweh is saying, this is my name forever, and this is my memorial to all generations. Now, please look up the meaning forever. Uh -huh. Okay, forever in Strong's is 5769, and it says, properly concealed, that is the vanishing point, generally time out of, out of mind, past or future, that is eternity, figuratively, especially with oof, always, ancient, right. uh, continuance. Th that's, mm -hmm. that's good enough, but the first mm -hmm. one, you can find conceal. So the religious scholars, rabbis, saw that one of the meanings of the word forever is conceal. And they decided mm. that Yahweh wants his name to be concealed mm. or hidden. So they decided from the best intentions, and as we know that best good intentions paved the way to hell, you know, but they decided to hide this name and, uh, and that's what they did. But they didn't uh, have, because, because they didn't use the principle of two or three witnesses. Mm -hmm. Now, even in this verse, if you will put it together, this is my name to conceal, and uh, it's a memorial to all uh, generations. It really doesn't 
uh, make sense until no. you have to conceal it for all generations. But if you go to the law and to the prophets, like Yahweh wants to declare his name, he wants this name to be praised uh, until the sun. He wants this, this name to be pronounced. Uh, I see five minute sign. Thank you. Uh, in uh, uh, Joel, I believe, and Apostle Paul repeats it in Romans 10, 13, he said, whoever calls upon name of Yahweh shall be saved. How can you call upon the name of Yahweh if it has to be concealed? Right. So they just, you know, didn't go to the witnesses. Another example, I talk to people, they say that the name is not important. And they say, look, there is a witness in the Bible. Please read Psalms. Uh, Psalm 138, verses 1 and 2. In Psalms 138 and 1, I will praise thee with my whole heart. Before the mighty will I sing praise unto thee. I will worship toward thy holy temple and praise thy name for thy loving kindness and for thy truth for thou hast magnified above all thy name and thy promises you didn't from uh the holy name bible yes Isn't right yeah well and that's that's the right translation but people don't use the holy name bible in the world they use mm -hmm. king james i need verse two in no. king james okay. bible king james uh, oh okay. you got it april uh-huh okay go ahead I will praise thee with my whole heart before the gods will I sing praise unto thee. I will worship toward the, thy holy temple and praise thy name for thy loving kindness and for thy truth. For thou hast magnified thy word above all thy name. So you see, they look in this uh, verse and it's similar translation in the Russian Bible because I deal with the Russian Christians, and say, he said that he magnified his word above all or every your name. It means name is not that important compared to his word. Now, when we don't know better, we can say, yeah, well, that's, that's the Bible. It's in the Bible. But when we know the purpose and when we know to go to the witnesses, we know that the name Yahweh is used more than 6,000 times in, uh, uh, in the Old Testament of the Bible, and it's always exalted, except this particular verse. So we don't have time to do this investigation, but if you do, and if you look up this word above, it means, you know, uh, according. Uh, it doesn't necessarily mean above. So the right translation, just read again, because in the Holy Name Bible, they use the right translation. And some other versions of the Bibles have similar translation. So you, well, so let me read for the sake of time in a new revised standard version. It says, mm -hmm. for your magnified uh, uh, your name, for you have exalted your name and your word above everything. And that's mm. the true meaning. And how do we know that it would be correct? We have to do our own investigation, which have to go in the strongs if it's needed. And we have to go to the uh, two or three witnesses. And the last thing, it's very important one. The science is not going to give us the right uh, understanding of Yahweh's purpose. Right. Because the true understanding of Yahweh's purpose is given only by vision and revelation. Mm -hmm. But science is important for us to confirm that the vision and the revelation which we have or understanding which we have is correct based on, on these witnesses. Now, let me give, I have one minute left, uh, left a quick example. You know this periodic table of elements? Mm -hmm. You know, if you yes. studied chemistry, you know this. You know that it was discovered by the Russian scientist. His name was uh, Dmitry Mendeleev. 
Now, he was a good scientist and he knew that something was going on. There is some kind of order or pattern in these elements, but he couldn't figure it out. So it's his testimony that once during his sleep, he had a vision how all this element came together in this table. It came to him in a vision and he woke up and wrote it down and had the revelation of what it meant. Mm -hmm. So even the science, how the scientific discoveries uh, made, it just confirms that the spiritual understanding of Yahweh's purpose, of his pattern, comes through the vision and revelation. So thank you very much for your attention and all praise and glory be to Yahweh through Yahshua the Messiah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. That brings a close to this night's session. That was a beautiful class. Thank you, Yashua. And thank you, Dr. Sasha Rakamilovich. Hopefully I pronounced that correctly. <laughs> Very scientifically, yes. Thank you. <laughs> Our announcements are as follows. We hold classes on Tuesday and Thursdays here on Zoom from 6.30 p.m. until 8.30 p.m. And sometimes Sundays from 11 to 1 p.m. However, this upcoming Sunday, there is an in-person class, which will be held at that time as well. And immediately following class, there will be a children's session. That session will not be recorded. Again, thank you everyone for coming out. And if we can stand in our heart or mind for doxology to be dismissed, I'll be reading from the book of Jude the last two verses. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy to the only wise Elohim, our Savior, through Yahshua the Messiah, our Sovereign, belong glory and majesty, dominion and power, both before all time and now and ever. Let us 